HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 121, recorded live Tuesday, July 8th, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks to architect Rick Barraza and developer Brian Perfetto about porting a Flash game to Silverlight. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And I'm sitting down today with the authors of Line Writer. Line Writer was a physics internet toy that came out in 2006, and it has recently been ported from Flash to, to Silverlight 2. Sitting down today with Brian Perfetto from In Exile and Rick Barraza from Synergy. Thanks, guys, for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you, Scott. So this was a really popular uh, internet kind of Flash game, and I think that uh, Flash and game are you know, two words that go together, uh, you know, just like apple pie. I mean, people always say, oh, it's a Flash game. But you have ported it over to, to Silverlight 2. That's correct. That's correct. Is that... Is that, uh, was that because, uh, did Microsoft come calling and say, we really want you to move this? Or was there, you know, what was it that was so compelling about Serverlite 2 that you would literally rewrite uh, a popular application like LineWriter, uh, from, from scratch? Well, I think the, the main reason was, was the performance. And I know, um, you know, Silverlight is just, just bounds and leaps, you know, leaps and bounds faster than, than Flash is. So performance wise, with people that make tracks that are thousands and thousands of lines long, we're able to get much better performance. Um, we're also able to do things like the MSN messaging, um, uh, music downloading, and playing while you're while you're making the tracks that you just couldn't do in Flash. Mm-hmm. Now that was kind of a throwaway statement, but I think it's pretty uh, powerful. We should back up and and talk about that for a second. You said that performance in Serverlite is is leaps and bounds over over Flash. Uh, and you you're, and you are both uh, Brian. You're a Flash and a Serverlite developer. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is actually my first Silverlight project that I've done, and I'm not too experienced with Flash, to tell you the truth. But just from okay. seeing the demos that, that Microsoft came, at, you know, we had a, um, a David Chow who came in and showed us the, the demos of the stuff of what, what Silverlight can actually do. Um, one of the things that sticks out in my mind is a chess program that he, that he showed us that could do, you know, millions and millions of times you know, calculations faster and, you know, deeper trees to figure out chess moves than the Flash version of, you know, the same exact code. Right, and this is because so Serverlite was compiled as opposed to being interpreted. Yeah, exactly. It, you know, you actually have a real back-end code base. You have the .NET framework and you have C-sharp as opposed to, you know, ActionScript, which is, is not mm-hmm. as fast, clearly. Uh, I, I would think, uh, I'd like to insert there, because at Synergy we actually do a lot of Flash and Flex, uh, as well as Silverlight and WPF, and, and uh, I've spent quite a bit of time, and I come from, from a Flash uh, background, too, and mm-hmm. I'd probably want to qualify that just a little bit, um, by saying that it's easier to write bad Flash, especially if you're coming from ActionScript 1, ActionScript 2. It's, it's a lot easier for people to start playing in this professional environment when they're really uh, not qualified, if you will, or don't have the training that you find a lot in, in the Microsoft the Developer Center because the barrier of entry is a bit higher. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I think, because uh, uh, I've seen and, and, and we've, we've written and, and we've seen and I've experienced very, very powerful uh, Flash games as well. This particular game, uh, because we're doing a lot of relay integration with the physics and, and just the nature of it and the algorithms, Silverlight was a good fit for this type of problem in that when you mm-hmm. are dealing uh, with these types of complexities, uh, and, and you want to lean on that type of environment, you definitely have a lot more support in the Microsoft developer community because there are developers mm-hmm. who are used to eating these types of algorithms for breakfast, you know, if you will. So, so they really care about it. Whereas you go to Flash, since it covers such a broad audience and there's so many different types of people developing Flash, uh, you, mm-hmm. you do get, uh, you do see a lot of bad Flash. But, but I, I did just want to defend that there is actually good Flash out there, very powerful Flash as well. For this no, particular absolutely. game, though, Silverlight was a good choice. I've seen a lot of really amazing, you know, kind of full-screen flex applications that are doing a lot of pretty 
pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I think that your point about this particular application, because Line Writer is an application where people uh, basically paint on the screen. They draw lines, and then they release this little man, this little man named Bosch, who rides on um, a little sled, and he, he, he rides these lines. And uh, in the Flash version, you would draw these lines, and it's keeping track of how many lines there are. And once you get over, you know, a couple, several hundred lines, you know, you're, you're starting to do a lot of computa- you know, computationally intensive work because you have basically a physics engine you wrote, you wrote in, in ActionScript. But now, yeah, as I understand yeah. it, you've ported, you've created a complex physics engine that's entirely in managed code in Serverlite, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I wasn't trying to bash, you know, Flash or anything as far as performance goes, but it, it definitely having that entire, you know, real programming language backend and having the .NET framework, you know, and, and like you said, it's compiled, it, it doesn't, you know, you get so much more, uh, sure. you get s- such a better benefit than you would as if you wrote it in straight action script. Hey, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do agree with that. I, I, I definitely, uh, when, when, when someone sits down and does a show like we're doing right now that is, uh, you know, here is someone who's ported from Flash to Serverlite. Don't feel like you have to, you know, apologize because, you know, Flash is a really good technology. Serverlite's a really good technology. But, uh, you know, there are things that, that some do better than the others. And I think that, you know, we're going to get letters. We're going to get emails. People say, <laughs> well, I did this in Flash and it was awesome. And you're, you're full of yourself because you think Serverlite's better. But I of wanted course, to find out what, what was it about Serverlite in this particular instance that made Line Writer you know, want to switch over? Because it's a pretty big deal to say, you know, we're going to jump ship and we're going to jump to a different engine. So there were, like you said, there's, there's the physics engine. Yeah. Uh, and then, then uh, what are some other features uh, that you, you really wanted that you, you couldn't do in Flash that you, you wanted when you moved over to Silverlight? Well, one of, the, one of the cool things that you can do in the Silverlight version is it's actually got MSN Messenger integration, which, of course, is not, not available in, in ActionScript or Flash. And what that allows us to do is you can create a track, you can, you know, you know, make the best track you ever made and send it to your friend through MSN Messenger and say, here, look at this track and tell me, you know, tell me how awesome it is or tell me how cool it is. And it just wasn't possible in Flash and ActionScript. So it's and these really are nice libraries that, they get, that Microsoft has on how to integrate Silverlight with, uh, yeah, with exactly. Messenger? It's part of, I mean, it's, uh, I think Rick can touch on it a little bit more because that was more of the synergy, um, a part of, of the development process, but, uh, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, that that's just part of Silverlight, you know, base, base code. It's just an API that you can add on to, to interface with MSN Messenger. It, it definitely is one of the uh, advantages, one of the things we're excited about in Silverlight, and, and one of the reasons uh, why, for, for this project, Silverlight was the right choice, is, is since they're both Microsoft uh, properties, and of course they're designed to work well together, uh, like like the Adobe properties will, but if we want MSN Messenger and we wanted it integrated inside of the rich experience, uh, mm-hmm. then Silverlight 2 was, was a very strong choice for that because, uh, that's, that's a lot of the push that's going forward. So we were able to integrate, uh, from Silverlight within the game to bring in your messenger contacts to sign in directly, to send messages and receive messages as, as well as game information. Um, and, mm-hmm. and just as a reminder, this was ported over and the the interface was built in in a relatively very short period of time, and that was only possible uh, because of of how closely integrated Silverlight and the uh, Messenger and the Live uh, uh, API uh, work together. Mm-hmm. Now I know that there are, there are, you know Silverlight's a beta technology, and there are definitely places where Silverlight uh, you know falls short. I understand that there are places in Silverlight where it, the, you get, the, you know, the library support isn't there because you don't have the full base class library underneath you. But that you could potentially pull in different libraries. You could pull in JavaScript. You could pull in, uh, you know, you could talk to HTML. How many times did you have to say, well, we need to stop working in Silverlight and we're going to call out to some JavaScript library and then jump back in? There, there was a spot when we were sending information back. Uh, again, since this was a, a game port, and we're building off of a lot of the, the great work in Excel already had with the Flash game, with the Flash client uh, addressing uh, data pages on the server side. Um, there's, there's certain data uh, uh, interfaces that were required that aren't currently there in Silverlight because it was beta. So there was certain uh, types of uh, encoding uh, that we needed to do uh, through the Java, uh, through JavaScript. 
but we we found the support to be there. The the good thing is that these these are known issues, so we'd raise them up as we as we get to them, and and we had a lot of very good support from Microsoft and a lot of the community. Um, Jose, uh, who isn't on the call today, but he's down from Australia. He's working closely with Microsoft in, in Australia, specifically with this messenger and a lot of these encoding issues where we're really working on that edge where Silverlight 2 is, is still in beta. The, the features are there, but they're not feature complete yet or they're still getting developed. So we ran into a couple of those on, on this project, and, and those were definitely interesting times to, to be working uh, under such a quick, quick deadline. Mm-hmm. That was Jose Fajardo from Synergy, also that uh, that you're referring to. Yes, yes. Now, 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 Rick, you did uh, you know the UI designs. Uh, so, you did you do this in Blend, or where did you design the uh, the, the overall user interface? Uh, my my methodology uh, in in Silverlight uh, is is similar to how I would do the exact same work in, in Flash or Flex, where I usually do a lot of my comps in Photoshop. That's more of probably designer mm-hmm. preference uh, when I'm here with the clients. So I came up and I met with Brian and David Healy and a lot of the, the other great guys here at In Exile, and we we sketched stuff out. We we talked about what we wanted the experience to be. I was able to quickly do some static comps in Photoshop because I, I really wanted to to focus on on kind of the look at a very blue sky level what they wanted it to do. Mm-hmm. Um, once we go from the photo from the Photoshop comps, uh, I personally uh, start developing right off the bat with Visual Studio and Blend both open at the same time. I, I like mm-hmm. writing XAML by hand, so I can block out a lot of things by hand, um, bring in PNGs when needed as placeholders in Blend, uh, and also Visual Studio. Uh, the, the DPI issue is, is an issue because of Silverlight uh, and, uh, mm-hmm. and Windows in general, 196 DPI, and Photoshop automatically saving for web at 72 DPI. So, so that caused a bit of a headache uh, from time to time in the process. But um, but that's usually how we go. Once once we go from static Photoshop comps, uh, we start uh, building out interactive skeletons with Visual Studio and Blend simultaneously. Do you know how to make the possible out of the impossible? Well, the .NET ninjas at Telerik do. They just released a huge pack of web controls all built on top of ASP.NET AJAX that will help you build impossibly fast and interactive applications in no time at all. They've made the impossible possible in desktop development. If you think you can't have a carousel component in WinForms, well, you can. Their Windows Form Suite features a super powerful grid view control and 32 other crazy desktop components that'll give you dazzling WPF-like features, but in WinForms. They do the same thing in reporting solutions with a new design surface like nothing else. Looks just like graph paper. Gives you advanced page layout capabilities. Makes it feel more like a graphic design software than a reporting solution. Go check them out at teleric.com and be a .NET Ninja. And thanks for listening. How long did it take you to get used to XAML? Because, you know, we had some uh, XAML guys on last week from Conchango, and uh, when when they found the limitation of the tool, they immediately dropped down into basically Notepad as well. I'm hearing that over and over, that if you really want to exploit XAML, you need to understand it. I, I uh, Since I'm very comfortable being a developer, and we also, we've been working with Silverlight, from from the beginning, and we were in the FizzPop, uh, the regional and, and national design challenge. So so we've been in a lot of situations where we've already need to be living and breathing XAML for quite some time. So when we started the InXile project, um, I'm kind of already at that point professionally where where XAML isn't anything new to me anymore. So I feel very comfortable writing it by hand, working with it in Blend, um, but but usually most of the time just going straight in Visual Studio. Mm-hmm. And was there anything about Silverlight's uh, that that just didn't work? Is there anything that you dislike about it? Because uh, you know I've done a couple of Silverlight applications. I think I'm more of a WPF person, uh, and you know it's a beta technology. But uh, you know what what's bad about it? Uh, everyone says things that are glowing, but I'm trying to understand. Surely it must fall down in some way. <laughs> Brian, do you want to do you want to give your impression first? Yeah, um, you know. As far, as far as this game was concerned, and I can't speak for other Silverlight experiences, but since this is such a simple game and, you know, it, it was created basically with, you know, the object-oriented mindset uh, in the ActionScript code um, already in place, porting up to Silverlight, you know, to C Sharp from ActionScript was, there's really no problem with that. I mean, it, it, as far as the Silverlight um, is concerned, 
you know, coming from ActionScript, it was really easy. There's no, mm-hmm. there wasn't really anything that I fell down on as far as the game game side was concerned. Now, um, I know maybe we had a few problems, like like you know, um, Rick has already touched on as far as stuff not being uh, being there because it's the beta version or, or you know, um, not fully like implemented. Like library support, as, you're saying that yeah, something it, that you needed wasn't available. Yeah, exactly. But as far as the actual, you know, the straight game code. It was, there's really nothing that it didn't do. It was an easy port and, and it, it was porting up from ActionScript. So it was, you know, a, a, an easy street, an easy process. Hmm. Okay. From the user experience side, uh, I think it kind of breaks down in, into two primary camps. One, one being a, a paradigm of what the user experience is and what tools need to do to develop it. And then the other mm-hmm. one actually just being the implementation of it where, uh, Silverlight, with with the XAML, uh, with the code behind, and, and having that distinction there, and, and having these two different applications open up, Visual Studio uh, and Blend, if you really want to be serious with it, because because if you're doing any type of developing in itself, Blend as it currently exists, where you're, it's really just your XAML editor, but then you want to be doing the code, uh, you switch over to Visual Studio 2008, the the um, the visualizer inside Visual Studio 2008, I, I never use it myself. I open straight into XAML and then toggle to, to blend when required. But, but mm. that environment for, for most user experience people who, who we can just assume are coming from a Flash world, coming from an Adobe world, if you're doing rich experiences up until last year, of course you were doing it in Flash. Of course you were doing it in Flex. So it was the, the primary technology. So, but you're used to doing it in, in one program. You're used to being in Flash where you can design, press one button, and instantly you're, you're in the code environment. So that mm-hmm. took a while, several months ago. I, I made that transition uh, already, and, and, and all of us you know, at Synergy, of course, we made that transition. But that was the first big hurdle to get over in that the, the approach to it is different. We're not used to having that separated out for us, design in one application, development in another application. We've kind of been used to everything being a little bit more sloppy, but a little bit more mixed together <laughs> in, in one primary product. And the other approach, yeah. of course, is is the difference between time-based animations and frame-based animations, and and that's more, uh, again, what have we been used to over the years? So that's a that's another transition, be it right or wrong, you know, whatever side of the debate people fall on, it still needs to be acknowledged that for years and years, most rich, experienced architects have we've needed to think in in terms of frame-based animations and placing things on the timeline. Uh, that we can control at a frame by frame basis. And so switching over to WPF and Silverlight, it does require a mental shift to think in terms of time based animations. You know, that's a very, very interesting point. I think that that's kind of one of the, the fundamental things that's different, uh, when moving from Flash. And the last time that I worked in Flash, it was called Future Wave. So that dates me, uh, pretty considerably. That may have been before Brian was born. And, uh, <laughs> but it, I remember all the onion skinning, and it was definitely a frame-based animation and having many, many things happening on the screen at once. Now, Brian, you had said this is a simple application, but I, I drew some line writer lines that were, you know, four, five, six hundred lines, and it went on for a while. I thought I was pretty clever, and then I went and saw some YouTube videos where people were making some unbelievably complex stuff. One of the big issues that we still have in the Silverlight version that we're trying, you know, we're working really hard on trying to figure it out, but it doesn't look like there's an easy solution for it. Um, essentially, the floating point precision, as far you know, with round off errors and, and other, uh, the way it's handled and implemented in ActionScript versus Silverlight is just fundamentally different, and it's only slightly different. Um, I know the problem we're running into is literally 12 places past the decimal point are off by one number, and that throws off an entire track. So when you have a feature like we have in the Silverlight version, where you can import a track that you've already made in ActionScript and bring it in, the physics act differently, and the, liner, the, the writer can crash it at a point that he didn't crash in the Flash version, and your track is just fundamentally different. So it's something that we, we definitely want to fix because we want people to be able to play the same tracks that they made in Flash, but it's turning out to be a really tough problem. Now, that's interesting, and that brings up one of the, one of, one of the uh, more interesting features, which is what you just said, that you can import existing tracks from the Flash system into Silverlight. Now, how does that work? I mean, where do these tracks live? Is this just a matter of pulling them from the server? Well, actually, the, the tracks actually live in the SOL, SOL files, which are the, the saved objects or shared objects from Flash. And we uh-huh. literally pull that in um, directly to Silverlight. And 
um, I actually wasn't the one who did that, so I can't tell you the specifics about it, unfortunately. Um, mm-hmm. But I believe we go through through Java um, in some form. JavaScript to, to Silverlight. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's the way it's handled. But yeah, essentially because I know that a shared object in Flash is kind of like a Flash cookie, right? It's exactly, Flash yeah. is isolated storage. So exactly. I would guess you'd need to have a Flash application. You'd have to have a Flash instance, a Silverlight instance, and a JavaScript bridge all working together. That's exactly. exactly that's exactly, exactly how it was done. Wow, that's hardcore. <laughs> It, it it really was uh, like Brian like Brian was was bringing up uh, when you go into import it it was also interesting because then you have your domain issues and your security issues between who can open whose shared objects so if you if you played the cl- the classic version of line writer that was written in flash and you did have shared objects flash shared objects on your local machine and now you come into the upgraded beta version of line writer written in silverlight silverlight actually needs to to talk to a flash importer because it's only the flash importer that can that can legally have access to the flash shared objects pick it up translate the information and then bridge it over through javascript so so it it was a very interesting uh, procedure there getting getting information that's shared that's saved in one format locally to just another folder, a couple a couple folders down on your Silverlight mm-hmm. shared objects under the new Silverlight data structure that we had, but uh, but um, it was a very interesting, uh, uh, it was a very challenging problem. It definitely underscores the fact that these two technologies have their own sandboxes, and they really are going out of their way to keep you from messing around in your <laughs> sandbox. I mean, certainly it may be just right there, a couple of folders away on your hard drive, but we can't have them talking to each other. Exactly. But it, it does make me wonder how much JavaScript did you end up with? Is this this is ninety nine percent Silverlight, or how much JavaScript's in the background there uh, making things happen? Well, what was interesting specifically on the importer is that there wasn't that much JavaScript at all uh, required at all. If you if you remember, or or anybody who used to work with Flash a couple versions ago, having Flash play nicely with JavaScript across all different browsers was was actually quite a challenge. But they've done a lot of improvements over the last several versions where JavaScript can now call in and Flash can register its its functions out to JavaScript. Now Silverlight, although it's only on on version two in beta, uh, from the be- from the beginning, they've really been focusing on on JavaScript integration. So we have this pro we have this situation where we had Flash, uh, I believe version version eight um, of the classic game, and we have Silverlight version two, but they're both very good at interfacing with very few lines of code to JavaScript in a stable fashion. So we're actually doing a lot of the the initiating of stuff from Silverlight. The bridge is basically a, a very simple handoff, and, and we're letting all the other work happen in both Flash and in Silverlight. So it's not as much JavaScript as, as you might think, only because Silverlight and Flash play with JavaScript very well. Yeah, I think that there's definitely an expectation of of plugins now, and now that uh, the JavaScript DOMs have finally kind of coalesced around some agreement amongst the major browsers, that there's a certain expectation of of, uh, of quality and functionality when it comes to to JavaScript talking to plugins. Now, this works on a Mac. It does work on a Mac. Um, I know that the, the Silverlight is supported on. Um I don't believe it's it's supported on PowerPCs. Is that correct, Rick? Right. It's only it's Intel based Max. Yeah, Intel based. Uh, but it actually it's interesting um, that you know, we get a lot of complaints from the people on the forums for you know this new Silverlight version that it does run considerably slower on on the Mac and, and um, even slower than than the Flash version. So um, it's interesting that it's not you know the performance doesn't enhance the Mac version where it huh. does. Have you figured out why version. that is, or talk to the team? Uh, you know, we had, um, I think Jose was down in, yeah, at the Microsoft, uh, he's at the camp, Rick, is that correct? The, earlier mm-hmm. when we brought this issue up, and yeah, I think it was just a known issue, that it's just not, you know, it doesn't run as great as it does on the PC uh, when it's on the Mac. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, and, and that's not that's not a, a surprise in, in the Microsoft or Silverlight community. Um, and it was similar... Uh, to uh, again early versions in in Flash only up until recently, uh, I believe with the with the new ActionScript 3.0 compilers, are are we really seeing a lot of increased performance on on the Flash experience in in um, browsers in in Mac 
that Silverlight is is duplicating the, the same kind of a procedural path. I think it just the the experience slows down on the Mac for most of these objects inside of browsers on a Mac. Hmm. So I, I wonder if that has something to do with the way that Mac deals with plugins or or what that is because it's very interesting. I've got two Macs. I've got a MacBook Pro, which is an Intel based Mac, and then I've got a small Mac Mini. And fl- um, I can barely watch full screen flash videos on YouTube on my Mac Mini, which is Power PC based. I find Flash just brings that thing to its knees, and yeah, of course, because yeah. it's Power PC based, I can't run I can't run Silverlight. But even on my MacBook Pro, if I go out to a terminal and run Top, uh, Safari is just killing itself. If I run anything that's Silverlight based on my uh, on my very very fast Intel based Mac. Yeah, I I have a Mac myself. Um, since I've been working so much with WPF and Silverlight, though, uh, I dual boot and I've been booting into Vista so that I can have uh, immediate and uh, access to, to Visual Studio and, and all of my my Vista development uh, products mm-hmm. here. But uh, but I notice it the same thing based on which OS I, I boot into. Interesting. I'll have to ask the team about that because I think that would be a very interesting discussion to find out how much code they're sharing and, and if that is a, an issue with Silverlight or if it's an issue with the plugin model or how that works. Because I I don't know a whole lot about uh, about the Mac and, and how that plugin model uh, operates. Yeah, it is a challenge we we find out in the out in the trenches of, of building Rhea and, and making it cross browsers. Is that that benchmark is there that things drop when you're switching it on the Mac under certain environments, you know? And so we, we're mm-hmm. all trying to figure out how to how to work around it or, or fix it. Now, did you guys have to write any, uh, you know, if I'm on a Mac, do this, else do that kind of code? I spent a lot of time working in Java, Java applets at Nike, and we ended up, uh, we used to call it write once, debug everywhere uh, <laughs> when using these, you know, these little applets. And we ended up having to go and write code that literally said, you know, if you're on, a, uh, you know, if you're on Netscape <laughs> 4, paint this way. Does that exist in Silverlight? I know from the game side of things, we didn't have any 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 of that. But um, Rick, maybe you can touch on. Uh... Yeah, there was a, an internationalization issue, and and again, I, I wish Jose were here because he's he's the one who both found it and then addressed it. And I think right after he addressed it, uh, when when he addressed it through some through some code, I believe Silverlight, as it continues to to push forward on on beta, came out with a fix like the, the exact same fix like a, like a week later. So it was kind of funny. But there are some inter, uh, internationalization issues that working on on a real game because you know, a lot of us have played with Silverlight and WPF and done demos or, or or done you know projects. But but Line Rider is a very popular game. It gets hit globally by many 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 people. So the deployment of, of this very very serious exposure of Silverlight application online ha- had a lot of, of issues that you, you really wouldn't run into in other environments. And, and one of them has to do with Silverlight and how they handle uh, internationalization or, or their lack of support as of right now for, for different keyboard arrangements, for example, and, and for different keystrokes were, were causing errors and, and needing a capture for that. So uh, I think we were... Uh, we were one of the the most vocal people, and that would be Jose, on the phone constantly mm-hmm. with Microsoft with the Silverlight team, and and getting a lot of great support, but kind of saying, you know, hey, these are issues that that we're finding again right here in the trenches, pushing Silverlight at this at this level of scope out. We're we're running into crashes when somebody has a German keyboard layout, you know, for example, or when somebody's doing this or when somebody's doing that. So so um, th- that's an area where it's still getting fleshed out in, in the Silverlight beta. Interesting. Now, from an input perspective, I would think you would need full control over the keys. You would need control over the mouse, the mouse wheel. Uh, did you end up doing mouse wheel work? Uh, I don't think it's uh, it's supported. We, we didn't have any the Zoom. I, I believe uh, it, it does work in the Flash version, but um, we didn't. Uh-huh. We actually took it out because we were seeing weird issues with uh, with Silverlight when you would actually use the, the, the scroll wheel. Um, uh-huh. it, it, I, I don't know if you remember that this Rick, but the uh, actual hotspots for locations where the mouse over would be would be off by the amount that you'd scroll down on the page. That's the right. Mouse wheel, that's mouse right. Wheel. It, Actually, it you know, I, I ended up doing uh, mouse wheel work in Silverlight and had a lot of trouble with it and then ended up uh, doing it all in JavaScript. Okay. Rather than Rather than trusting Silverlight to do the work, I realized that it, the, the browser's job was to be managing a lot of that input, particularly on the yeah. mouse wheel side. And since JavaScript has such rich mouse wheel support, 
uh, when doing a Silverlight deep zoom sample recently, uh, we just ended up using a JavaScript event sourcer that would then pass those events down into Silverlight. And that gave me really, really reliable, uh, mouse wheel support. And, uh, and you can get all that sample code now, uh, if you look for deep zoom and mouse wheel. It's all JavaScript that works really, really well. That's interesting. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, it was very interesting. There's a, there's so many different things, but even in that mouse wheel support, uh, you have to go and check, uh, are we on Opera? Because Opera passes a different Delta format than if you're on Firefox. So while the browsers have wheel event support for JavaScript now, they haven't agreed on what format, uh, that's going to look like. So you can do that translation inside of the JavaScript. But I bet you, you could get your Java, your, your JavaScript mouse wheel, uh, back, uh, if you took a look at that. So let me think uh, a couple last questions as we get ready to uh, to wrap up the show here. Uh, how long did this take you to do? I get the impression it was pretty quick. Yeah, the the initial port um, of the, not any of the MSN Messenger stuff or the new UX stuff, uh, but just straight port from Flash to uh, Silverlight took about a week. It, it was a very, very short timeline, uh, and that's everything fully functional. Uh, and then the, the rest of the port, um, um, I want to I wanna say two months, Rick? Yeah, we we started around um, the beginning of May, and mm-hmm. uh, we were getting uh, into the uh, debugging of it and and really looking at getting it released ready by the middle of June, and then getting those bugs out. So yeah, around four four to five weeks um, of the development of it, or around three or four weeks of the development of it, and then and then several weeks finishing up a lot of the issues, getting importing working and, and stuff like that. So it was pretty aggressive. But one of the things that didn't help, and I guess this was another small technical point, um, was from beta two, they deprecated a lot of a lot of uh, <laughs> techniques. So uh, and, and I'm still amazed uh, Brian's what one week port because it was a substantial uh, amount of amount of code and, and a challenge. So so when mm-hmm. we at Synergy came to the table, they had already done an initial port of, of the actual game core uh, to Silverlight and um, mm-hmm. based on based on what had been available uh, at the time. And one of the things, uh, one of the techniques was still initialized from XAML. So around halfway through when we started getting the, the beta 2 bits, uh, access to them, the, the core all of a sudden broke. So that, that took a couple of days there because all of a sudden the, the primary methodology of implementing UI that the core had been taken advantage of initialized from XAML uh, was deprecated, and so all of those sections needed to be uh, needed to be uh, modified. So, so that was kind of interesting. Yeah, definitely working with beta software, and it's 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 moving under your feet. <laughs> exactly. It, it was funny the the when when Rick first came here, and he had actually we gave him a drop of the code. He the first thing that he said when he came, when I came in was that it clearly looked like it had been written in ActionScript, ported to uh, 1.0 Silverlight. And then port it again to 1.1 Silverlight. You, nice. you can actually see the, you know, the transitions there. Well, you can uh, write, you know, they say you can write Fortran in any language, right? <laughs> you can smell it. Yeah, you can, you can smell your action script if you look through your C sharp. <laughs> exactly. And then coming, coming from that background, you could definitely, you could definitely tell the action script because I've taught action script to designers and, and old school action script 1.0 and, and we're working on a series of tutorials with Microsoft and, and moving from action script to Silverlight. But, but there's certain just ways of problem solving and, and certain things you do. And if you've been programming it for a long time and you're not at a developer level, but more of an experience development level, uh, it, it gives you a lot of, uh, it lets you be very sloppy with your code if you want to. Just everything's a var, everything's an object. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to explicitly do anything. And, and you can still create these very beautiful things um, that might not have that same level of data robustness. So so when, when I saw the code, I go, this looked like, like it originally came from ActionScript, and then it was ported to 1.1. And uh, sh- sure enough, it looked like some of the things would be deprecated for, for beta 2. But um, it, it was interesting working, working with beta software. It's fun, though. It has that Wild West feeling. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Rick Barraza, Experience Architect at Synergy, and Brian Profetto, Developer at InXile. And you can check out LineRider at LineRider.com. And you want to keep an eye out for the Nintendo DS version coming out this August. Again, guys, thanks so much for sitting down with me here. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. (laughs) 